Hi, it's Mr. Ramage, and today's lesson is going to be about the Spanish-American War. What really sparks the war between America and Spain in 1898 is the island of Cuba. Cuba was a Spanish colony, one of the few colonies that Spain had left. The Spanish Empire had basically been falling apart throughout the 1800s and was on its last legs, so to speak. The Cuban people had been protesting and fighting for their freedom and their rights uh, since about the 1850s or so. And by 1898, things had really come to a head. The Cuban insurrectos had been destroying Spanish property, had been burning sugar fields, and the Spanish can either walk away from the colony and give it its freedom, or they can reinstate their authority over the island, which is the choice they make. So the Spanish sent to Cuba General Valeriano Weiler. And his nickname is The Butcher, and he's definitely going to earn that nickname and show why he had that nickname in the first place. His job is to go there and to put the island basically under lockdown. And his plan was to separate the rebellious guerrilla fighters from the people of Spain so that they would no longer be able to get any support. What he did was institute a policy called De Reconcentración, which essentially took people from the, um, from the countryside and moved them into the cities, uh, crowding them into those cities, overpopulating those cities, and then putting uh, fences and uh, barricades around the city to cut the people off from the rebels, essentially creating concentration camps. And in these cities now that are overpopulated, there are, uh, there's a lack of food and resources, the uh, malnutrition begins and disease begins to spread um, and people are really going to suffer under this uh, policy of General Weiler. We don't have exact numbers, but anywhere between 150 to 400,000 Cuban citizens are going to die as the result of these actions. And word's going to get out to the rest of the world, especially the United States, which is right next door to Cuba and has a vested interest in what's happening on the island. So the news of these atrocities reach America, and with the newspapers publishing stories and pictures like the one you see here of the suffering Cuban mother, uh, the American public wants war with Spain. The American people have a strong connection, or at least feel a sense of empathy and sympathy for the Cubans, uh, thinking back to the time that the American colonies rebelled against England. So there's a certain connection there, a feeling of brotherhood between the Americans and the Cubans. Um, and the American people are kind of pumped up and, and, and want to go to war. Uh, America is a young nation. It's trying to prove itself, and the public wants war. President McKinley, though, had seen war. He was the last president that had fought in the Civil War. And McKinley said, I've been through one war. I've seen the dead piled up, and I do not want to see another. So McKinley is not anxious to go to war with Spain because he knows what war costs. Well, the United States has a vested interest in Cuba, not just in terms of seeing democracy and freedom spread, but because of money that's been invested. Uh, U.S. business owners had invested about $50 million in sugarcane production in Cuba. So that is a lot of money for 1898. And overall, the United States did about $100 million a year in trade with Cuba. If the fighting and the um, conflict continues between the Spanish and the Cubans, that's going to disrupt American business. If Spain comes in and reinstitutes a harsh control over the island of Cuba, it might also mean that America loses those investments and loses trade with Cuba. So America has a financial reason for supporting Cuban independence and getting rid of the Spanish. Also, with the Spanish gone, the United States could probably uh, position itself to be much more active in Cuba, uh, investing more money and influence over the Cuban people. So why are the American people so pumped up about going to war with Spain over Cuba? Well, one of the main reasons is what's called yellow journalism. This is a period where American newspapers, in competition with each other for circulation and business, are going to report some pretty outrageous and sensational stories, some of which are true, but a lot of the stories are really exaggerated and some of just downright lies so that the American public buys the papers to find out the latest things that are happening in Cuba 
the latest terrible things that the Spanish have done. And these newspapers are going to begin to really fan the flames of war, really get the American people fired up in a way that really hasn't happened before. The two leaders in this yellow journalism phase were William Randolph Hearst, who owned the New York Journal, and Joseph Pulitzer, who owned the New York World. And both of their papers, as New York papers, were in competition with each other for circulation. And each of them realized that the more outlandish the story, the more papers they sold. So their newspapers published really outrageous stories, not just about what was happening in Cuba, but what was happening all over the country. And circulation skyrocketed, and the people just couldn't get enough of these stories. Now, the term yellow journalism actually comes from a cartoon character called the Yellow Kid who appeared in one of the newspapers, and um, they actually uh, printed him in yellow. You can see him here on the back of the slide, and it would leave a yellow residue on the newspapers, and that's where the term yellow journalism came from. Um, so these sensational stories are whipping up people's emotions and feelings. Much of the coverage by both the New York World and the New York Journal was tainted by unsubstantiated claims, sensationalist propaganda, and outright factual errors. Uh, they were the fake news of the day, but we are going to see how powerful and influential the media is in the Spanish-American War. Uh, the newspapers are going to get the people interested in supporting the Cuban movement for revolution and freedom and have these very harsh anti-Spanish attitudes. The newspapers are really going to make this war happen. And here is some uh political cartoon from the day showing Joseph Pulitzer on the left and William Randolph Hearst on the right, sort of coded in these newspapers, uh, one as a parrot and one as a monkey. And you can see the headlines of war, 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 let the people rally, delirious with rage, anything for war, uh, just commentary on the power of the yellow press to drive America to war. Well, as things escalate in Cuba, President McKinley does take some action by sending the USS Maine, which is uh, one of America's largest and most powerful battleships at the time, down to Havana, Cuba, to protect American interests in Cuba. Now, it was sent down sort of as a goodwill um, message and as a goodwill trip and a show of friendship between America and Cuba and Spain, uh, but it's really there to keep an eye on things, to uh, sort of protect American business and also provide American citizens with a way out of Cuba if things happen to go badly. So something interesting happens to the USS Maine. A few days after arriving in Havana, Cuba, it explodes. On February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine explodes in Havana Harbor, killing 260 of the 350 men on board. Immediately, within a few hours of the news reaching the United States, the Spanish are blamed. So Hearst newspaper reports that uh, there was Spanish treachery, and it led to the explosion of the USS Maine. It must have hit an underwater mine or uh, hit by a torpedo from a mysterious Spanish submarine. Uh, so without any evidence, newspapers begin to blame the Spanish for the explosion of the USS Maine. And as uh, emotionally wound up as people already were, this made sense. Why else would a ship explode mysteriously in the harbor? And despite the fact that there was no evidence to suggest that the Spanish had anything to do with the explosion of the Maine, the newspapers and the media ran with that story. We have bloodthirsty Spaniards as one of the caption here. Uh, there's a $50,000 reward for the detection of the perpetrator of the Maine outrage. And the Maine becomes a symbol that the American people rally around during the Spanish-American War with the phrase, remember the Maine. And some additional wartime political cartoon, Spain take notice, free Cuba on one of the guns and remember the Maine on the other gun as Uncle Sam now wants to go to war. So things are sort of getting out of hand, and by April 11th, 1898, President McKinley can't really stand in the way anymore. McKinley informs Congress that he would support a declaration of war on Spain, and on April the 25th, 1898, Congress is going to vote to declare war on Spain, and the Spanish-American War will begin. 
But there was one addition to the Declaration of War called the Teller Amendment, and this was added to the Declaration of War, and basically it states that the United States is not going to war with Spain to take Cuba as a colony. And this is very interesting because previously in our lesson about Hawaii, we talked about the fact that a lot of Americans did not agree with imperialism, that many Americans believed that it was against our national uh, ideology to go out and to annex and take control of other countries. President McKinley himself was an anti-imperialist and thought that this was something the United States was not supposed to do. It went against our values. And this is one of the reasons why the Teller Amendment was passed. So it basically says, well, it literally says, quote, hereby disclaims any disposition of intention to exercise sovereignty, jurisdiction, or control over said island except for pacification thereof and asserts its determination when that is accomplished to leave the government and control of the island to its people, end quote. So the Teller Amendment says we're going to go down there and basically remove the Spanish and then it's up to the Cuban people to run their own government. So this was done to pacify people who were anti-imperialism and to really make a statement to the world that the United States was not going to go down there and seize control of Cuba and make it part of the United States. Well, after the war is over, there's going to be another amendment passed called the Platt Amendment, which will slightly change this attitude towards what we're going to do with Cuba. Uh, and we'll talk about the Platt Amendment in our next lesson. So where's the fighting going to take place in the Spanish-American War? What's well, actually going to take place in two main places? And the fighting actually starts in the Philippine Islands on May the 1st, 1898. The Philippines was another colony of Spain. And prior to the start of the war, the United States Navy made its way closer and closer to the Philippines in anticipation of war. And on May the 1st, 1898, Commodore Admiral Dewey is going to attack the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay in the Philippines. Uh, and basically wipe them out pretty quickly and hold the Philippine Islands until American troops arrive and with the support of Philippine soldiers defeat the Spanish that are there. The fighting in Cuba doesn't start until June the 2nd, 1898. Remember, the United States had a relatively small military force and had to get itself organized in order to go down and to invade Cuba. There will also be a little bit of fighting in Puerto Rico, uh, but not much. Most of the fighting is going to take place in Cuba. But the war itself is going to be a relatively quick war. It's only going to last 144 days. And according to U.S. Secretary of State John Hay, it was a splendid little war. As he said, it has been a splendid little war begun with the highest motives, carried on with magnificent intelligence and spirit, favored by that fortune which loves the brave. The Spanish are going to surrender on August the 12th, 1898, and a few months later, on December 10th, 1898, we're going to have the Treaty of Paris signed between the two nations. So anytime there's a war, we always want to know what happens afterwards. What is in this treaty and who gets what? So in the Treaty of Paris, Cuba will become an independent nation. Remember, according to the Teller Amendment, the United States is not there to take control of Cuba. Cuba will be a free country and free to make its own decisions. The United States agrees to purchase from Spain the Philippine Islands for $20 million. And the United States will get control of the island of Puerto Rico as well as the Pacific island of Guam. Now, once the treaty was signed in Paris, it had to be approved by the United States Senate. And just like with Hawaii, there is quite a debate over this treaty and what the United States should be doing. Senator George Horace said, This treaty will make us a vulgar, commonplace empire, controlling subject races and vassal states, in which one class must forever rule and other classes must forever obey. So Senator Hoare does not see this as a good thing, that we as white Americans predominantly are going to have to rule over Cuban and Puerto Rican and Filipinos who are non-white, and we are going to be this vulgar, vulgar empire um, and he doesn't think that that's something that we should be doing. Senator Newt Nelson says, Providence has given the United States the duty of extending Christian civilization. We come as ministering angels, not despots. 
So Senator Newt supports the very popular idea and belief that the Americans were going there to uplift these people, to bring them out of the darkness and to enlighten them and to bring them Christian civilization. Senator Nelson may not have known that the largest religion in the Philippines at that time was Christianity. Uh, same with Cuba and with Puerto Rico. And Senator Henry Cabot Lodge said, if the U.S. rejects the treaty, then we are branded as a people incapable of taking rank as one of the greatest world powers. So to Senator Lodge, if we don't do this and we don't take these territories, then we uh, don't look as powerful as the rest of the world. The rest of the world's leading powers are taking colonies. Uh, why would we give them away? Why would we not take them? It will make us look weak if we don't take them. So the debate continues in the Senate until finally the Senate agrees to uh, pass and ratify the treaty. So Cuba here in, uh, on the map will become an independent nation. And a few islands away, uh, Puerto Rico will become an American protectorate where the United States will have control over the government of Puerto Rico. Uh, we'll get into more detail on what happens in Puerto Rico specifically a little bit later on. And then on the other side of the world in the South Pacific, the United States purchases the Philippines for $20 million. But there's going to be some conflict that comes up after this. And then the island of Guam, a very, very small island, much smaller than what you see here on the map, uh, comes under control of the United States, which will be perfect for another naval base out in the Pacific. So the United States is expanding its territories into the Pacific and into the Caribbean. And on our piece of political cartoon here, we can see uh, these uh, flags being raised over Puerto Rico and Cuba and Manila, which represents Manila Bay in the Philippines. And we have the uh, Uncle Sam slamming his fist on this terms of peace agreement so uncle sam brandishing a sword with a rather mean look on his face slamming down his fist showing his authority his strength uh demanding that the spanish agree to these peace terms uh, we can see the spanish uh, person here dressed like a matador uh, almost being knocked over to the ground by uncle sam and as he strikes the peace treaty document looking really shocked and uh surprised and then off in the background, it's a little hard to see what it says on the flag, but I'm going to guess that this is Hawaii, which, remember, was annexed in July of 1898 during the Spanish-American War. And almost as a result of the Spanish-American War, Hawaii was also annexed and approved by the U.S. Senate. So we have four flags being raised over four new parts of the United States. And in this piece of political cartoonage, we see three women here representing Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. Uncle Sam in the background with his feet up, rocking back in his chair, smoking his pipe with the bald eagle next to him, uh, sort of relaxing now that the war is over. Uh, and if you look at the bottom of the image, we can see the chains have been broken. And here is Lady Liberty blowing her horn of freedom, uh, releasing these uh, wonderful people from their bondage to Spain and allowing them now to be a free group of people. But are they going to be free? That's really the big question. And we're going to get into that in the next lesson. So the impact of the war. Uh, number one, it's the end of Spain's empire. With Spain's defeat of the Spanish-American War, their empire in the Pacific and in Latin America is pretty much over. America now emerges as a world power. America wins a war against a ailing and failing empire, but America now sort of enters the stage as a world power, someone that they're gonna, other countries are gonna have to take seriously, a country that is taking some control of lands in different parts of the world, expanding their reach into the South Pacific and into Latin America, uh, expanding their military and economic influence. So the rest of the world's going to have to recognize that America is an up and coming nation. So some key takeaways from this lesson on the Spanish-American War and a quick review of the events that we just covered. Rebellions against Spanish rule in Cuba get the attention of the United States. Sensational stories and reports 
called Yellow Journalism about Cuba made many Americans excited about war with Spain over Cuba and influenced the actions of the government and motivated the country to get involved in the war with Spain. The explosion of the USS Maine in Havana, Cuba, led the U.S. to declare war on Spain. The war ended quickly with a U.S. victory. The Treaty of Paris is going to give Cuba its independence, while the U.S. acquires Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, and that not all Americans favored imperialism. Remember, this is not a do-or-die thing for the United States. There still was a debate about the actions that America was taking. Not everybody agreed that we should be taking these actions and going to war and seizing other lands and colonies. So that wraps up our lesson on the Spanish-American War. Uh, next thing we're going to start to look at is what happens after the war is over uh, because things are not going to go well in the Philippines. And we're also going to take a look at the Panama Canal and America getting more and more involved in Latin America. And we're also going to dive into the topic of the white man's burden and look at the racial motivations and implications of imperialism.